uh, through the magic of wireless technology. I'm going to stand here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, quantum advantage in single-server uh, information theoretic peer, and this is joint work with uh, Dorita Aronov, uh, Kaimin Chang, Ayal Green, uh, Ching Yi uh, Lei, and Or Satat. So we're going to talk about uh, single-server um, private information retrieval, so let's sort of recall the setup, even though I believe that most of you have seen this before. So what we have is a server that holds a database, and this database is big. It contains a capital N entries. Um, and we have a client that has some index, um, and the client wants to recover the jth element uh, from, this, uh, from this database. Um, and uh, what we want is a protocol that will allow the client uh, to recover the jth element in the database in a private way. So in such a way uh, that the server does not learn any information about j. At least this is sort of the intuitive notion of private information retrieval. This is the notion of privacy. So uh, we, want to, we want to get such a protocol, um, and uh, so we have correctness and privacy requirements. And in this talk, I'm just going to talk about perfect correctness and perfect privacy. Uh, we can, you, this can, of course, be relaxed, but uh, it adds like you know, um, orders of magnitudes of complexity. So we're talking about perfect security, um, so no information about J is being leaked, and perfect correctness, so the correct value is always being learned. And the question is, uh, how much communication do you need in order to perform this task? So, of course, um, one uh, trivial strategy is for the server to send the entire database, like capital N um, bits of, uh, or elements of information. And the question is whether it's possible to do it with, um, less, uh, with, with less communication. Optimally, uh, you would want something like log N uh, bits of communication, because, well, just information theoretically specifying the index J takes something like log N bits, or takes log N bits exactly. So this would be uh, sort of the optimal goal. And the question is, um, one question, the first question that you would ask is whether this is possible to achieve um, information theoretically. So in our case, even perfectly, uh, with perfect privacy and perfect correctness. And once you think about it for a second, you realize that this should be impossible, at least sort of in the more uh, well-studied um, uh, model of classical communication. Uh, and the reason is because the transcript does not reveal any information about the index J, then this means that we can essentially sample J after the fact. So uh, the client does not actually commit to, to the value J. So after executing with a server, he can decide, well, actually, the value J that I want is, well, J equals 1, J equals 2, J equals 3. And because of, the, uh, because of the correctness, he's actually going to be able to recover the entire database without any additional communication, so just based on executing the protocol once. So uh, this is not possible uh, with classical communication. So the next question that you would ask, well, at least in this session, is whether it's possible uh, to use uh, quantum communication to help. So what do I mean by a quantum communication protocol? Well, now, instead of just exchanging classical bits, um, the, the client and the server can also exchange qubits um, or quantum information. And they're also allowed quantum, um, uh, and they're also allowed quantum communication, uh, quantum computation, sorry. Um, I should say that even though we're talking about an information theoretic setting, whenever I will talk about algorithms, I will present efficient algorithms, and whenever I will talk about impossibility results, the impossibility results will also hold against unbounded, uh, unbounded entities. So the fact that we're talking about information theoretic uh, uh, setting does not actually sort of uh, take away anything. So why would you hope even that quantum communication can help in this setting? So when you think about uh, quantum information or qubits, then um, uh, you realize that, uh, uh, unlike classical information, quantum, uh, quantum information in general cannot be copied. Where, so this means that this sort of notion of, I'm going to keep this transcript on the side and use it many times, well, you need to think a little bit about uh, how to actually sort of generalize this argument. In addition, the process of uh, measurement actually allows you to destroy information in the quantum setting, so this is, again, something that could be useful when you talk about privacy, the ability to uh, sort of uh, d destroy information uh, uh, in a way that is not recoverable information theoretically. So um, you would think that perhaps uh, quantum, uh, uh, quantum communication can help in this setting, uh, but uh, sort of when you think about it a little more, uh, you actually realize that for a reasonable model, uh, this should not be doable, and this is a long sequence uh, of works, uh, actually starting with uh, low in 97. I will talk a little bit more about it. Um, so you can actually think about as a generalization of the classical argument that I described before, uh, but the way that I will present it is actually sort of in a slightly different way that will be more useful for our purposes. Um, but 
let's not give up uh, just yet. So there are some restricted models where uh, you can actually show some quantum advantage. So for example, you can assume uh, some structure on the database, but this is not the setting that we're going to talk about today. What I do want to mention is at least two works uh, by Legal and by Karenidis et al. Uh, that do give some um, protocol that has non-trivial um, uh, communication complexity, but the privacy model is actually not very clear uh, in, these, uh, in these works. And the tension between these two things sort of made us sort of try to think whether it is possible to define a meaningful model where these positive results actually do make sense and do imply some notion of, of privacy, or you know, whether uh, you can just sort of uh, put it in the trash. I think uh, sort of the way that Legal at least presents his work is he shows this protocol and analyzes this protocol and then says, well, here's the reason why this protocol is useful. So we're saying, you know, let's let's wait a second and, and think for a, a bit more before like putting these things uh, away. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the attack, uh, the superposition attack. Uh, and as I said, this method was used uh, in, in many variants to sort of show uh, impossibility for many cryptographic uh, applications in the information theoretic, in a purely information theoretic setting. So starting with commitments, uh, I think the first work that uh, considered to some extent, uh, private information retrieval is by Nayak, the same work that where he showed impossibility of uh, random access codes. Uh, and the last work that I know of is by uh, Baumiller and Broadbent uh, in um, 2015. So uh, let's consider a quantum protocol. Um, and our protocol, I'm going to talk about Peer specifically, it has classical functionality. So we can think about a classical database as input and a classical index uh, as, the, uh, as the input for the client. And uh, the functionality is that for any classical database, uh, we're guaranteed that the client should learn the jth element of the database. So what is the attack? So rather than executing the, uh, pro rather than executing the protocol on a classical database, you're actually, actually executing it on a superposition of databases. And one, the, the first thing is that you might think that this might not be well-defined. However, because uh, the original protocol is well-defined for classical inputs, then you can actually sort of extend it. You can think about it as sort of a classically controlled quantum circuit and extend it to a unitary that actually applies uh, also to a, to a superposition. Uh, so this is a minor technicality. This can be done. Um, and what you get when you apply it, when you apply the protocol in superposition, is sort of a superposition of executions of the protocol. How does this help? Well, or how does this uh, help in showing uh, something bad? Um, so one thing that you can say is that in this um, execution over superposition, in the end, we are required that the client actually learns some value. It learns the jth entry of the database. And this actually means that the jth entry of the superposition will actually collapse to a classical value, because the, the client actually learns some value, and this value needs to be consistent with the um, database, the, with the database uh, array that uh, the server holds. So we know that jth entry is going, to be, is going to collapse. On the other hand, since the communication complexity is low, then in a sense, we know that uh, the um, superposition of databases behaves like a superposition that don't col doesn't collapse much. And through the magic of uh, quantum Fourier transform, um, you can actually uh, sort of translate these two statements into the following things. So the fact that most entries do not collapse means that after you perform Fourier transform, almost the entire array is going to be is going to be zero, and the fact that the jth entry did collapse means that actually in the jth entry you're going to get a random value. So putting these two together, it means that the server can actually learn the value j, and the parameter sort of depends on what you assume on the um, communication complexity and correctness and, uh, and security. Um, so this is, uh, this is the uh, superposition attack, and it shows sort of a pretty strong uh, privacy, uh, pretty strong privacy violation. Um, so we know that this is uh, um, not this. So this is uh, why uh, we think that uh, why people think that uh, quantum has no, quantum communication has no advantage in this setting. Um, but uh, let's let's try to sort of uh, uh, try to think about uh, the model of privacy that we uh, a model a reasonable model of privacy or the weakest possible mo model of privacy that we can think of that actually makes sense and see what happens uh, when we try to apply this attack. So let's talk about sort of, uh, I guess, honesty and curiosity in, in, uh, the, quantum, in the quantum setting. So um, as I said, we do know of these non-trivial protocols. So Legal uh, um, presented a protocol with square root of n communication complexity between the uh, client and the server. Uh, and Karenidis et al. 
um, they showed a protocol um, with actually like almost perfect communication complexity up to a constant, so only O of log n. But they did not do it in the sort of standard model that I described here. They require some setup. So they require that um, the server and client pre-share some quantum correlation or entanglement between them. And in particular, this entanglement uh, needs to be pretty big. So you need capital N uh, of these so-called EPR pairs uh, in order to execute their protocol. However, these EPR pairs, of course, do not depend on the input. And actually, as we show in our paper, they can also be reused. So after, you continue, after you're done executing the protocol, you can actually recover uh, the, the setup, at least if the server and client cooperate, and reuse the protocol and re rerun the protocol. So this is a slightly um, a stronger model to require a setup, but you get a much stronger um, uh, result in terms of communication complexity. So what can you show about uh, what can you show about these protocols? So um, what was shown, at least in uh, Legal's paper, so the Kirini Digital paper doesn't talk about uh, it talks about um, uh, quantum information uh, quantum information cost and the privacy is only a tool uh, that is used there. They're talking about mutual information. So um, I think this specific analysis does not appear there, but it can be done. Um, and what you uh, what uh, at least Legal shows is that for any database and any index J. Um, after any uh, after any uh, message um, um, after any sort of message that is exchanged in this protocol, the local state of the server uh, is independent uh, of the value j, um, or you know if you want to be fancy, the density matrix uh, of the uh, sort of marginal um, uh, marginal uh, state of the server is independent of the value j that uh, that the client holds, and this is true for any uh, database, for any classical database, and any classical index j. Um, so this is uh, this is you know one notion of uh, um, of security that that you can think of, but it's it's actually kind of weak because um, well it allows or at least it gives rise to some uh, um, notion that I'll, I'll call the honest model the honest model. So normally you know in, in uh, cryptography we try to talk about uh, honest but curious, uh, but let's try to think about a purely honest uh, a purely honest model uh, in this context. And um, in the in the purely honest model we just assume that uh, uh, the server plays by the rules completely, and we want to argue that even in this case uh, the um, the information that is learned about J is um, um, is zero, so you don't get any information. You don't get any information about J. And let me emphasize that it's actually important to require that this holds after any um, after any message that's exchanged in the protocol, because well, as I said, quantum information can be destroyed. So you can say, like even trivially, uh, the client could just send J to the server. The server is going to um, send back the value uh, the, the value of the database in J, and then afterwards uh, measure in the Hadamard basis, which essentially means that you eliminate all the information about J. So in the end of the execution, uh, the server does not have any information about J, but still we don't view this as sort of even even this is not even honest privacy, I would say. So we want to require that uh, at any point in time uh, the server does not does not have inf information about uh, information about J. So this is what I call uh, this is what I call honest privacy, and actually you can think about like a slightly stronger version because I told you that the server can destroy information in the end of the in the end of the protocol, but perhaps it's also not fair to ask of it to destroy information during the protocol. So you can think about uh, a purified honest model where we just assume that the server cannot perform any cannot perform any measurement. Um, so this is sort of the honest model. However, the standard model that people uh, normally consider for quantum protocols is uh, called specious privacy, and this is a somewhat stronger model. There, you sort of assume that uh, the server is allowed to have, in our case, uh, this is defined for general protocols, but I'm going to talk about peer. Uh, the server is allowed to have a secret drawer where he can uh, sort of hide information. And what we're going to say, we're going to require that uh, at any point in time, we can sort of call up the server and say we're coming to do an inspection. And then the server can sort of tidy up the lab and put whatever he wants in the drawer. But then we come to the server's lab and take the server state and also take the client state, take these, the joint state together and compare it to what was supposed to have happened in the honest protocol. And at any point in time, the server should be able to sort of tidy up the lab in order to produce uh, a joint state that is consistent with the state of, of an honest execution. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, the specious model, and again, this is sort of quantified over, uh, over all possible inputs. 
Um, so this is, uh, this is clearly a stronger model. And um, for example, if you want to talk about uh, the superposition attack that uh, we described before, well, uh, again, you could say, well, when we, come to the, when we come to the server's lab, we're going to check whether the, um, the state of the database register is in superposition or not. However, you could think about uh, a, what a purifying register. So you can think about generating a state. And this is actually what happens if you just think about an EPR pair. So if you think about an EPR pair, if you look at the marginal distribution of each bit, then it looks completely uniform. So if I take an EPR pair and put one of the bits in the drawer and just show you one of them, then you'll think that I just generated the classical uh, random bit. However, when I take the second bit out of the drawer, then I can actually sort of recover uh, the original superposition. And the superposition attack can actually be executed uh, in the specious model. And this is uh, sort of why, in this uh, uh, sort of reasonable model, you cannot get, uh, uh, you cannot get any quantum advantage uh, for, for private information retrieval. Um, I should say that sometimes people refer to specious privacy as the quantum analog of uh, honest but curious or semi-honest. Um, maybe it's the closest analog that exists, but actually specious uh, privacy is stronger. And you can define specious privacy also in the classical setting. And there is a very simple example that's in this uh, Dupuy et al. paper that shows that uh, specious privacy, even in the classical setting, is stronger than uh, semi-honest. So this is just a sort of pedagogical remark. Um, so let's try to think in the context of these, uh, uh, in the context of these uh, definitions uh, that we discussed, uh, what can we say, uh, how can we sort of relate the notion that we get, the, the privacy notion that we get from these non-trivial protocols to uh, these, uh, um, to these notion, notions that we um, just discussed. And one thing that we can, that we can see is that here I said that uh, in the, in the non-trivial protocols, I said that um, um, this uh, condition holds for any database and for any value j. And by that, I mean every classical database and every value j. Whereas both, when I, both in the honest case and definitely in the specious case, the honest case, I don't think it's defined in the literature, but definitely in the specious case, you are allowing the, um, you are allowing the input uh, to be in superposition. And you allow auxiliary input, which effectively allows the input to be in superposition. Um, so there is, uh, there is some gap here which sort of leads to um, our attempt to define, a, to define a, a model that is both as close as possible to this specious model and uh, also captures um, non-trivial um, non non uh, properties of the quantum, the quantum setting. So uh, the first result that we show is this new weak privacy model, and we call this anchored privacy. And the, the point in this model is just to not allow uh, the, input to be, uh, the input of the server to be in superposition. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is essentially defi the definition of the model. Um, I'm going to talk about it a bit more in the next slide. Um, and what we show is that um, the, previous, uh, the previous protocols, uh, you can show that they're um, anchored honest and proof. So this anchored thing just essentially means that uh, the input of the server must be classical. So you can sort of adapt it to the honest setting and also to the specious setting, and hopefully in the future for more settings. Um, and what you can see is that, well, just by observing the analysis that, that was done before or redoing the analysis for the second algorithm, um, you can show that if the, uh, if the protocol um, keeps the server pure, so if the server does not perform any measurements in the protocol, which is indeed the case uh, in those protocols that I discussed, um, uh, then uh, you can uh, sort of prove that it's going to be secure in this anchored honest model. We then show that if you have um, a protocol that is secure in this, in this model, so this uh, anchored honest model is actually, does actually imply privacy also in the anchored specious model. So actually, if you're preventing this superposition attack, so the only thing you're not allowing to put your input in superposition, um, then, in fact, the honest model actually converges uh, with the specious model. So um, maybe this uh, sort of the, the anch maybe anchored honest uh, seems kind of weak, but anchored specious, well, hopefully it seems slightly less weak. Um, so uh, this, uh, this actually shows that, in a sense, the superposition attack is the only thing that stops you from getting, uh, from getting protocols with perfect communication complexity, because we know that we have uh, that there exist protocols in this model with, communication, with logarithmic communication complexity, although with this little star that you need the pre-shared entanglement. 
Um, the last thing we show is a lower bound uh, for one-sided communication, which essentially helps us to show that this uh, pre-shared entanglement actually doesn't help much. Uh, in, uh, it's the, the reason why we are able to get, uh, we're able to get stronger results is not because of the pre-shared pre entanglement. Um, so let, let me talk a little bit more about uh, anchored uh, specious privacy. So we put an anchor on the, uh, on the database entry. We force the database to be, uh, um, to be a classical value, not in superposition. And in terms of uh, making it a formal definition, it's actually not very hard. You just take the definition of species and add an additional requirement that uh, the, um, the, the state of the, the, state of the re uh, register that holds the database has to be some classical value, a, speci a specific classical value. Um, and again, what we showed is that uh, if the server is pure, so it does not perform any measurements, then um, um, anchored honest uh, privacy also implies anchored uh, specious, uh, specious privacy. So just uh, having this uh, hidden drawer does not actually, is not actually going to help you. And let me um, sort of briefly explain why. But before, uh, as I said before, um, before I do that, let me say that, as I said before, um, uh, this uh, could be some indication that uh, you know this superposition attack is in, is very strong, but it's perhaps sort of the only strong tool that we have, uh, the only strong tool that prevents us from getting um, uh, the. So whenever this attack does not apply, you can hope to get uh, very good communication complexity for peer. So the proof idea uses, uh, at least I like to think about it as a variant of this notion of monogamy of entanglement. So. What we're saying is that um, if, the, uh, if the server is pure, uh, we can, uh, does not perform it or does not perform any measurement, and, uh, the, client, uh, uh, and the client is also, uh, can also always be made pure because we don't have any privacy requirement from the client, then the, joint, the honest joint uh, client-server state uh, is also going to uh, always be a pure state. And we know that if you have a pure state, uh, then um, even if you have like an additional register in the drawer, then uh, the, these two registers has to be, have to be tensor products of each other. So the additional information that you have in the drawer is not actually going to be correlated at all with uh, the sort of the information that you need to show for the inspection. So you might as well not put anything in the drawer, and therefore um, the, the uh, convergence of the notions of specious and honest privacy uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So this is the definition, and this is what we can do with it. But let's take a step back and ask, well, does it even make sense to, to make this definition? Um, I don't have super strong arguments, but let me, let me try to convince you anyway. Uh, so first of all, I, I, at least it's not trivial to write it down. Uh, I mean, uh, you, can, you can write it and stare at it, and it doesn't uh, Im immediately, uh, immediately seem trivial. But moreover, um, I don't think it's completely contrived. So, um, does it make sense with uh, foreseeable quantum technology? I don't know. What is foreseeable quantum technology? I'm sure other people are more qualified to answer than me. But one could imagine a, sta one could imagine a state of affairs where um, you're forced to store your, uh, your for the server is forced to store their database on some media that cannot be easily placed in superposition. I don't know. Think about uh, taking your database and just writing it on a piece of paper. Um, it's going to be pretty hard for an adversary to put a, put a piece of paper in superposition between uh, all possible values. So you could maybe think uh, that uh, in some settings uh, this is actually something that you can enforce. Um, also as a, as a sort of um, just for in terms of scientific inquiry, right? We want to understand uh, the state of the art. This was the mot motivation for uh, this uh, uh, for this uh, entire study. We want to understand this tension between the uh, strong negative results and these Weird positive results, and this is one formal and this is one formal way uh, of uh, making it uh, of uh, sort of formalizing this connection, and hopefully this is going to be a stepping stone for a stronger notion. I'm going to talk about it in my um, last slide about open problems. So I'm skipping the slide about the lower bound on um, one-sided communication complexity. You can see that in the paper. Um, so um, this is we think about this just again just as a first step. Um, you can think uh, of trying to find now that we have a model of security, can you come up with better quantum peer uh, in, this, uh, in this model, in the honest model, in the anchored model? Um, so can you get uh, log n communication without entanglement, again, in this weak model? Um, 
And uh, uh, these protocols actually require multiple rounds of communication, uh, whereas uh, sort of the protocols that we like are just two rounds, a uh, um, message from the client to the server and then a message back. Uh, can you get the single round protocol with non-trivial uh, non properties? Uh, I should say that the Karenidis et al. Uh, paper uh, actually has uh, a protocol that we, that we don't analyze that gives polylog uh, communication complexity um, without entanglement, uh, but again, they work in a different model, and one should check whether it holds uh, in, in this uh, anchored species model as well. I would guess a yes, but this is just a guess. Um, extending this uh, anchored notion to the malicious setting, so we have some ideas, um, um, but uh, we don't have any results in these models. Uh, and perhaps once you have this notion, you can think about other applications other than peer. Uh, for example, um, fully home, like information theoretic fully homomorphic encryption is something that comes to mind. Can you com come up with um, a weak yet meaningful model where this is uh, possible? Thank you. We have time for one question. Hi. Um, admittedly, I haven't read your paper, so I should check the details first. Uh, but uh, the model kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, quantum oblivious runs, if you have ever heard of it. So where logarithmic communication complexity is also possible. So I was wondering if you can tell us something about the, the difference or uh, if you have looked at it. So I don't know about quantum oblivious RAM, but I mean, I do know of obliv oblivious RAM. So there, uh, you want to say that the access pattern. Mm. So I guess the, the, my answer is that the connection should be the same as the connection of classical private information retrieval and, uh, um, and, uh, um, and ORAM. Um, so one thing is that uh, in, in uh, ORAM, the uh, um, all the all all the all the, the sorry all that the uh, server sees is the uh, physical access pattern, right? And you want to hide the logical access pattern. Uh, here, the server also sees the um, sort of the internals of the database. Um, this is sort of what comes to mind. But the, the, these these models are different, and I imagine that they're different in the quantum setting as well. So one would need uh, I would need to th uh, think about the definition for a second before I can say. Sure, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>